England made 498 against the Netherlands, and they broke the world record. They also lost nine balls, which means that the Dutch were embarrassed and it cost them over $1,000 in replacements. The easy thing here is to say that the Netherlands are a poor team and England are the World Cup winners, and so of course they made these runs. Although, at the moment, both of these things are true. But to break a world record, a lot of things have to go your way. So shall we look at them? This is the last knot. My dad told me to say this. And you need to remember that England were not actually playing the Netherlands. They were playing, I don't know, a Netherlands A team in some ways, maybe a development squad. And it is worth mentioning that not all of this English team is first choice as well, but they did have Livingston and Butler, right? But it's certainly nowhere near a full strength Netherlands side. In their full strength team, they were missing Colin Ackerman and Rolla van der Merwe, both batters primarily, but Ackerman is a top quality pro who could certainly bowl some handy off spin. And Roloff is a veteran of South Africa and the Big Bash and the IPL and kind of everywhere else and can bowl extremely tidy white ball spin. But there are also other frontline bowlers missing like Paul Van Meeker and Brandon Glover and Fred Klaassen. Klaassen is the only one who was actually in Amsterdam at the time, but sadly he was injured. If you compare the two bowling lineups, the one they used against England and this one, this one is just way better. Logan Van Beek and Peter Saylor are very good bowlers and obviously Baz Dalidi and Shane Snater are developing quite well, but it's nowhere near the amount of talent I've just talked about. And there are reasons for Dutch players to pull out of their national team. And this is quite an important summer. This is maybe the biggest Dutch cricket summer ever in their history. And some people think might be the biggest ever. This is the biggest Dutch summer ever in their history. They don't even know if they'll ever have another summer like this. But in order to play for the national team, they have to take a pay cut. But it's not just that the Netherlands play them less, it's that the Netherlands is match by match. They don't know if there'll ever be this many matches with the Netherlands in another summer. Whereas most of them are in county cricket, and they know they're going to be getting contracts for this year and probably future years. So you have a situation where the Netherlands are playing their most important summer, but some of their best players are bowling for North Ant's second eleven. And the problem with associate cricket can often be the replacement level players. If you look at the Netherlands squad, there are a lot of younger players here just learning their games. Like for instance, their leg spinner, Philippe Boisevain. He's 21 and has been coached at the Darren Lehman Academy in Australia and is clearly still in development. When he started getting hit by Dawid Milan, he actually went around the wicket, but clearly he was inexperienced at this because he started spinning the ball in from around the wicket, when actually it would have made more sense if he bowled wrongens and then he also bowled a back foot no ball. I'm assuming that's just because he hasn't done it very much before. Later, he came around the wicket to right-handers and he pitched the ball outside off stump, when the entire concept of coming around the wicket as a leg spinner to a right-handed player is to spin the ball from outside their pads. Arjen Dutt is again another young spinner from the Netherlands. He's tall and he gets really good bounce. But in this game, he did something weird again. When he started getting hit, he came around the wicket to the right-handers. That makes sense. But then he delivered the following balls outside off stump as well, which is completely into the swing arc of any right-handed batter. Offies do come around the wicket to right-handers sometimes in white ball cricket, but they usually bowl what they call in cricket a back heel line, trying to slam the ball into the pads with no room at all, not floated up gently outside off stump. And there was also Baz de Lida, who is perhaps the most exciting prospect we've seen from the Netherlands almost ever. He can bowl high 80s and they've been using him to bat at number four, but he's very raw at the moment. And when he started to get hit, he decided that he was going to bowl cross things. But instead of banging it into the pitch halfway up to get some inconsistent bounce, he bowled full. Later on, he would bowl two consecutive slower ball bounces, and they were two straight with fine leg up. Part of the idea with that particular ball is to be outside off stump, so the batter has to drag it with no pace on the ball. This isn't a lack of talent. Baz Dalidi is a genuine talent. Arian Dutt looks like he's got a lot of skill. And Boyce Vane clearly can bowl leg spin. But this is players who just haven't developed their games yet and now are being thrown into this level of pressure. And against England, that's a very high level. Although part of the reason England could put so much pressure on these younger bowlers is because the Netherlands kept dropping their stars. They managed to drop three out of the four top scorers along the journey. And the two really important drops were Phil Salt and Josh Butler. Both easy enough outfield chances. The Butler one probably hurts the most because, you know. He decided that Peter Saylor had to go and smashed a bunch of sixes. But Saylor was trying to go under the bat, giving him no length to work with. 
And he finally got his man, only for Musa Ahmed to drop a very simple catch at long on. Quick side note, Peter Saylar is an incredible story. Someone who came from outside the Dutch cricket bubble, didn't know anything about the sport, played at Lords, didn't know what Lords was, didn't have cricket pads, all these sorts of things, to go on and captain his nation. It's a very sad game for him to have to play his final game for the Netherlands. Now, with the drops, England would have kept going regardless. But if Sultan Butler had gone early, then the world record's probably safe. The easy thing to say here is it happened against the Dutch because they're not a very good team playing on a club ground. But then you have to look at the previous world record, which was against a little known team called Australia. And it was at a ground that not many people have heard of called Trent Bridge. And considering how associates often go against England, both Ireland and Scotland have chased over 300 against them. They were probably trying to get as many runs as they could just to make sure that that didn't happen again. But as a general rule, you would expect most world records to be against struggling teams. Even Bradman averages less against England than he does against other sides. What's been more remarkable for England is that they've managed to smash so many good sides as well. I wasn't at the ground for this match, so I don't have the exact dimensions, but I did talk to Bertus de Jong from Crickbuzz. And you can see from the television, this is clearly a ground that's on the smaller side. Not everywhere though, it does seem to have a very decent square boundaries, and that's what Bertus told me as well, but straight is certainly a small hit. And as I mentioned before, the ground with the previous world record score was Trent Bridge, which has weird dimensions. It has a very short square leg boundary where they cut it to make it shorter so they could fit in an ugly stand. But mostly it's known for having quite short straight boundaries. And when you're making these very, very, very high scores, it is much easier to do if you are hitting straight. Because if you're hitting consistently across the line to a short square boundary, it means that you're more likely to miss one or hit it straight up in the air. But if you're hitting straight consistently, you're actually taking away that chance. We also need to talk about the pitch. This was a good pitch to bat on. Yeah, no shit. And you wouldn't get a world record if it wasn't. I mean, you really need it not to spin for the bounce and pace to be completely consistent. And in this case, for there not to be a hint of sideways movement after just a little bit of swing that Shane Snader got early on. The interesting thing though, is that as Bertus notes here, the pitch is not usually like that. They made a pitch that was great for batting, which is the opposite of what they usually do. And fine, it's a big series and you wanna look your best. But the problem is putting out a pitch this true and this fast is like giving England runs. We all know, the low and, we all know that low and slow wickets are probably your best bet against them. But even just having anything for your bowlers is a better. England are made for this kind of pitch on a small ground. But let's get to some of the England players. Andrew McKenna referred to Phil Salt as having a baseball-like backlift on TalkSport. And later on, we were contacted by someone from the Guildford Mavericks, which is a baseball team, to say that Salt actually played a couple of seasons for them and that their US coach thought he could go on to be a baseballer. From a cricket perspective, Salt is also interesting because of how few hundreds he has made in his professional career. This was only his seventh in over 200 matches. And that's because he's a little bit baseball-like. He hits big, but he doesn't stay around very long. Here, he combined the two, which is really how England have been leaning for a long time. They want players who can hit, but also don't worry about accumulation because they have a longer batting order. But to score in innings like this, you really do need an opener to go big. Alex Hales did it for them in their previous world record. But you have to go big and fast, which is not the easiest thing to combine. And this was only the second time in his 50-over career that he actually managed to make 100. Probably because usually he goes so hard he doesn't stick around that long. Dawood Milan, on the other hand, is all about the accumulation. And I find him very interesting because there are two ways to look at what he did. You can argue that in England teams without Root or Morgan, and yes, I know Morgan technically played, but he's not really batting at the moment, is he? They require a player who is a fast accumulator or, I don't know, a light anchor. I haven't really come up with the perfect term for this yet. And Milan still scored at a decent rate. He scored at 6.84 runs and over for almost 20 overs of the game. But that also means that the rest of England had to score at almost two runs a ball, which on its own is ridiculous. But let's move past that for a second. As I said before, there are definitely two ways of looking at this. Either Dawood Milan is the reason that they scored so much because his innings allowed everyone else to attack in fifth gear almost from the start, or he's the reason that they didn't pass 500 runs because he batted so slow. I don't have a great answer for this, but it is a fun theoretical cricket twister.
But there is no doubt that Milan actually allowed for Livingston to be his T20 self. And Liam Livingston actually has only played 62 list day games. And you wouldn't say at the moment he's had the same impact in domestic one day cricket as he has in T20s. In fact, outside of England, his strike rate is basically 100. However, when he plays for England, it's only six matches so far, his strike rate is nearly 150. Now, obviously it won't stay like that. But in innings like this, he basically is given a free swing. England bat deep, there was a set batter at the other end, and England encouraged their players to be as free as possible. And we know what Livingston can do with a free pass. Actually, considering how he was hitting the ball early, he was 46 from 13, Netherlands are probably lucky he mistimed a few at the end. But that's being a little bit unfair to the Netherlands. Because while Logan Van Beek's figures would suggest he went 8.2 runs and over, and you're probably thinking, that's a lot of runs per over. He actually had some brilliant moments in this game as the lead bowler of what was an attack, let's be honest, designed to be smashed. And my favorite of those moments was his final over. He had Butler at one end in full flight and Livingston mid berserker mode. England were now clearly eyeing 500. I mean, they needed 30 from 18 balls, which is just not that far off, especially the way they were batting. And then Van Beek simply mixes up wide and straight Yorkers. It wasn't revolutionary but he nailed the execution of almost every ball and somehow two guys eating raw beef stopped for salad. And that does show the difference between Van Beek and the rest of the bowlers. He's a tried and tested professional, wholehearted cricketer, very clever and very good skills. He's probably never gonna be an elite player, but he knew what he was doing. But even so, we've seen IPL bowlers struggle to slow these two down. And because of that one over, Netherlands weren't the first team to cough up 500 in an ODI. Although, Snater gave it a red hot go with his last two deliveries. But of course, we've talked about all the different factors except for one. If they had got 500 runs, as much as Salt's knock and Milan's ballast and Livingston's madness all played a part, Butler was the real reason. When England broke the record last time, Butler failed. But when they broke the world record the time before that, I'm sensing a pattern here, he made 90 from 51. So 162 from 72 is some jump on that. If you go through the history of one day cricket, the only real comparable players in ODI striking and average at this point are Viv Richards and AB De Villiers. Viv still stands out as an ODI player. And it's also telling that no one could copy his method for decades afterwards. In fact, he still has a top 20 strike rate of all time, despite playing in an era when taking successive singles was seen as an act of madness. AB was different as in many ways he was the natural evolution of limited overs batting. He was a great test player who could adapt most of his skills to continue to dominate both formats of white ball and red ball. But he was still sort of bound by the theoretical laws of old cricket batting. Butler was burst by the new game. He started with scoops and laps to the quicks. It wasn't an optional extra that he signed on for later. And when he hit for power, he didn't do it like a normal batter. The way that Butler hits is much more like a golfer or a hockey player. And he's also not a great test batter like Viv and AB were. He was okay, but he certainly doesn't stand out. In white ball cricket, he's clearly hitting his way to an all-time career. Two of the three times England broke this world record, Butler did much of the breaking. If he opened in ODIs, he would be my bet to be our first 300 run scorer. And if you look at this innings, for all the talk about the Netherlands struggling and drop catches and small grounds or whatever, it was really Butler who almost got them to 500. But the really interesting thing about this record is even if they were too short of 500, they've pretty much changed 500 from something theoretical to something we would definitely see in reality. But whether it's Butler or someone else, the way that England is currently playing ODIs, they are showing us something. It's that there's no doubt that 500 is no longer theoretical and is very close to being reality. And then where next? <laughs>